Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session about OpenStack and Open Daylight. Um, my name is Nir Achiel. I'm a product manager. Let's give him maybe one more minute to join. Do it again, maybe. People are still coming, so. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to this session about uh, OpenStack and Open Daylight. My name is Nir Yachil. I'm a product manager with Red Hat uh, looking after uh, our OpenStack platform product, specifically on uh, networking and Open Daylight. And here with me is Andre Fredret, uh, who is the technical director of, for SDN in our Office of Technology. Uh, the agenda we have for today is um, basically I wanted to kind of uh, briefly explain what is an integrated infrastructure for kind of modern SDN NFV uh, deployments. And I'm going to touch the high level common use cases we see on the market. Um, and then we'll deep dive into open daylight and what is the open daylight project and specifically how it works when it goes to open stack integration and a project called NetVirt. Um, and then spend some time uh, explaining what we are doing in Red Hat OpenStack platform and Open Daylight. Uh, you have the slides here. They're publicly available, so you can take a picture or just use the URL if you want to see the slides. So some context before we begin. I wanted to start with this slide, which is kind of saying, OK, there's the enterprise IT and the telecommunication NFV market. And in principle, yes, there are, like, there are, these are two separate markets with uh, kind of unique applications and concerns. But I think we're, as, as much as we are talking to customers and users, we kind of are getting into the point that very large enterprise deployments are really kind of a service provider-like deployments. And it's... We can see it all over the place with the type of applications, with the requirements, with the kind of the DevOps state of mind, um, and the technology being used. Uh, so, for example, uh, there's this trend of automating everything, which is you know important for everyone. Uh, next generation architecture, so stuff like L3, leaf spine everywhere, routing everywhere, kind of you know big scale, um, NFV, which is really a telco concept. Uh, but definitely enterprise can benefit from it as well in terms of virtualizing common functions and networking services in the campus or the enterprise. And again, this DevOps and cultural change, uh, which is much more kind of uh, operational driven. And um, so the network is transforming. Uh, the kind of uh, line between classical enterprise and service provider is not that clear anymore. Um, and some common use cases we see. So the very first one here, uh, I call it network virtualization, uh, which is kind of the classical enterprise use case, if you wish. And then under it, there's data center virtual networks. There is campus branch virtual networks. Uh, micro segmentation, which is just a fancy way of doing distributing firewalling everywhere. So these kind of use cases are really typical on the enterprise side. Um, and on more on the telecommunication side, we see residential services, so stuff like VCPE, um, and then the mobile, which is really big, right? There is the RAN section on the access side. There is all the core and EEP EPC, and then the value-head services uh, that the service provider wants to offer. And then the traditional kind of business services, L2 VPNs, L3 VPNs for connectivity between different shops or enterprises and so on. Um, and I wanted to pick just two of them, uh, the residential and the, and the mobile one, and kind of explain from high level what the use case looks like. Um, so this is like a typical kind of service provider network uh, offering residential services. 
And you can see over on the left side, this is the uh, CPE, the customer premises equipment, usually a very dumb kind of router or um, uh, kind of modem device sitting on your home or maybe kind of a small business. And then there's this demarcation point between uh, the home and the service provider network. And then there's different uh, access technologies, could be GPON or cable or DSL and so on. And then once you are at the core of the service provider network, this is where we want to virtualize everything, right? And you can see here there is an example of different uh, VMs that acting as, as VNFs um, effectively offering different kind of services, uh, like quota management, parental control, uh, traffic optimization, virtual firewall, and so on. And this is where you really need kind of an SDN solution to manage everything here. And a common requirement would be I want to do service chaining because I want to tailor for this particular customer, this particular kind of SLA and quality of service and, and, and the kind of the chain of services that he's, he's paying for, right? The other one is the mobile services example, which is, again, a big one. And this is kind of a typical high-level architecture of a mobile uh, network. Again, we have on the left side, you can see the RAN, or the radio access network uh, kind of domain. Uh, and it's very common to see just with, with NFV, basically a passive antenna, which is going to get the signals from the mobile devices. And then immediately, we are going into fiber, into what used to be the base station. Right now, the base station is going to be on the service provider kind of infrastructure. In this case, it's kind of centralized. It can also be distributed more close to the antenna. Uh, but the virtual uh, BBU, it's essentially the, the base station version. Uh, and we, we're getting the traffic. And once we are at the service provider network, then we're going to the core. This is more the EPC, the Evolve Packet Core use case. Again, all, all, all type of um, devices that traditionally were at physical boxes and providing different kind of uh, functionalities like MME, signaling gateway, packet gateway, and so on. Um, and then on the virtual GI LAN, this is where we want to enter traffic before it leaves to the internet. And this is, again, where we need service function chaining um, most, oftenly, most often, um, again, to offer different services based on your particular um, package with the service provider. Um, and Trying to kind of generalize the requirements for, for all of that, we see a huge demand on the field for standardized control of network. And today we have this kind of notion of underlay or physical network and overlay or virtual network, which is kind of weird because in the end, it's all kind of one service, one network. And maybe from kind of engineering perspective, it's very easy to think of a service as an overlay, right? It's just a point-to-point -point kind of VXLAN or whatever, right? Uh, but from an operational point of view, it's a nightmare, right? I mean, traffic should, should traverse some physical devices, and you need to have, like, end-to-end -end visibility into, you know, where the traffic is going, what's the kind of end-to-end -end user experience, quality of service, monitoring, and so on. Um, so we really want to get rid of this underlay and overlay kind of terminology and provide kind of a seamless integration into the network, which is something we are missing today in the SDN market big time. Uh, so we're talking about fabric configuration and con control, like physical fabric. You cannot escape from your network and just provision the v-switches. Um, overlay, I mean, if there is an overlay, so we still need to configure the overlay, uh, be it some v-switch or v-router, you want to control uh, the configuration there. And then support for the Neutron API. Uh, which, again, is the de facto kind of API for networking, and we're seeing tons of SDN solutions out there that are essentially bypassing Neutron, which I think is kind of a bad thing for the community and for everyone here, because we don't want to bypass Neutron with extensions and third-party stuff. We do want to en enhance it and make it kind of a robust API we can utilize for all the use cases we care about. So these are kind of very important kind of pillars of standardization that uh, in my opinion, are, are, are key to, to the success of SDN. And then support for different data path connectivity type. Um, so again, we all started with some basic kind of, you know, virtual machines, Vue.io on the guest, and probably something like OVS. Uh, but then in reality, we end up in this kind of crazy hybrid deployment with Linux bridges, OVS, OVS with DPDK, 
uh, and there's cool stuff coming like VPP, like FDIO, and so on. Um, and there's also SRIOV, which is not using any kind of virtual uh, uh, switching on the OS, but we still need to support guest using SRIOV with physical function, virtual function, and so on. So we do need somehow to basically support all this kind of different data path connectivity option and still provide some visibility and at least of operational experience to the, to the customer. Um, open source standard base is, again, uh, also a common requirement. Uh, there are tons of solutions out there. Um, and open source doesn't mean just that the code is in GitHub, right? I mean, we need the community. We need the feedback. We need to see kind of the development end to end. And we think it's really a key requirement today. I touched before about service chaining, uh, which is I mean, it's clear to see why it's important for the service provider market, market for kind of the VEPC, VCPE use cases. Uh, but also, as I said before, on the enterprise side, there is going to be value of you know, providing different kind of uh, value head services like load balancing, DNS, and so on, using appliances or, or VNFs. So you, you do need some service chaining uh, capabilities in your platform. And then there is the boring stuff, right? So nobody wants to work on kind of reliability real, real, real and av availability, uh, event correlation, security. But in the end, this is really, really important stuff, um, as well as IPv6 support, right? So we are in 2017. Uh, IPv6 should be pretty much a strict requirement uh, on most deployments. And I'm not talking about just IPv6 for kind of workloads, but also from a control plane in infrastructure perspective. Your API endpoints and so on should be reachable with IPv6. So this is usually kind of the stuff that we neglect because we want to work on the next big thing and the next big technology, but we do need to provide some like, basic availability and reliability functions in our solutions. And then last but not least, are ready for future innovation, uh, which is, again, a big thing because, I mean, we are all here in OpenStack Summit and we are kind of dealing with open source technologies and tools, and you see that the rapid evolution and like, there is like plenty of projects, and you can see like each and every week something is announced. Uh, and you don't want to go with something which is very monolithic. You want this kind of, of, of uh, modularity and ability to basically plug in into the new shiny thing that's going to solve your, your use case. Uh, and talking about future innovation, I wanted to talk about the two napkin protocol uh, from 9089. So I don't know who are familiar with this protocol. Hands? Come on. <laughs> okay, so this is actually BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, um, which is probably the most important protocol on the planet today. Uh, and this is how it started uh, almost three decades ago. And it was started with two napkin uh, by two fellows from Cisco and IBM basically scratching some protocol, wanting to solve very particular, very specific use case, which is how we can exchange route policies for IP between different autonomous systems. That's BGP three dec decades ago. This is how it started. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with BGP, uh, but today BGP is basically multi-protocol BGP with tons of difference of implementation and use cases uh, like IPv4 unicast, IPv4 multicast, VPN for IPv4, that's for L3 VPNs, uh, for IPv6, L2 VPNs, VPLS, eVPN, so all sorts of good stuff which is built around BGP. And uh, this is all thanks to those two guys uh, three, three decades ago who kind of understood that if the platform, if, the, if BGP is going to be modular enough and it's going to provide kind of a framework for networking, you'll be able to grow it and add more and more and more um, interesting use cases to it. Um, and I want to really th um, think about open daylight is kind of being the new BGP, not to say that we are going to replace BGP with open daylight, but that we want to inherit kind of the same uh, platform robustness and framework uh, characteristics from BGP and kind of implement them in open daylight. Um, and Open Data is just a general purpose Java platform, right? You can write whatever applications you want on top of it. Um, it ends up being an SDN controller, uh, which is a very common use case for Open Daylight. And it's really a robust platform. 
Okay, it's not like a one-trick pony kind of a you know solution for one uh, very particular problem. It's a general-purpose controller that can be applied for many applications and use cases. And there are um, um, cases of open daylight being deployed to manage IP kind of routing, optical transport, uh, fabric for data centers, overlay, and so on and so forth. So very uh, kind of uh, varying use cases and applications that can be fulfilled with open daylight. Um, with that, I want to hand it over to Andre, who is going to deep dive into open daylight and open stack and the technical details. All right, thanks, Nir. So I'm going to start off by just reviewing really high level of, uh, about where we plug in. So it's uh, open daylight is a, is a Neutron uh, back end. So Neutron has really three main components, an API, the orchestration layer that's responsible for configuring the, the network to satisfy the needs of OpenStack, and then some type of programmable data path that can be controlled by the, the orchestration layer. With the upstream uh, reference architecture, we have a Neutron Server as the, as the Neutron API, and uh, the ML2 OVS plugin or driver, uh, together with a collection of networking uh, agents, Neutron agents, that uh, do the configuration and management, and then Open vSwitch as the, as the programmable data path. With Open Daylight, it, it's very much the same, just plugging in a few different components, still have Neutron Server, but then we have a different plugin, the networking ODL driver, and then Open Daylight on the, on the back end doing the configuration, and we get rid of most of the agents. And the, uh, and the programmable data path is still, still support OVS, but then a, a collection of other options, so OVS with uh, DPDK, uh, layer two gateway, VPP, and, um, and hardware devices as well. So Open Daylight is a, it's an SDN controller platform. It doesn't actually necessarily have to be SDN, as Nir mentioned. That, that was kind of the initial use case. But uh, hosted by the Linux Foundation. Last month, it, it turned four years old. Uh, so it's been around for a while over the uh, course of this time. There have been a thousand, over a thousand different individual contributors from 140 different companies, uh, organizations. Um, it uh, has a mature open governance, mature code base, dozens of solutions uh, based on open daylight, and uh, many deployments. So just, just back to the slightly different picture of those, that, that high level, when we, when we look at this with the OpenStack solution, we look at OpenStack as the orchestration, Open Daylight as the controller, and controlling multiple uh, different types of devices. The networking ODL is a project um, that, uh, that implements this, uh, the, this Neutron, the Neutron driver. So it consists of a lot, like, uh, similarly to a lot of other uh, plugins, uh, a, an ML2 plugin for layer two, a layer three plugin, and a collection of service plugins for the, for the advanced services. And then these communicate with Open Daylight over a REST API. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the modularity and, and uh, the open, what, what really is Open Daylight. And yeah, we use it as an SDN controller, but it's really a Yang-based microservices platform. So you can think of the kernel as this MDSAL layer, model-driven service abstraction layer. That's really the, you think of it, the this distributed data store for all of the applications. It provides the data, data, RPCs, notifications, and clustering support for high availability. And then on top of this, we build services. And um, they can be anything you want. They need to be defined by a Yang uh, model, and the, the Yang model provides a well-defined API so the services can cooperate. And uh, furthermore, within Open Daylight, there are tools that will compile these Yang models and generate Java code, uh, Java APIs that can be used by the, the services that are being developed. You know, now typically in, a, in, the, in an SDN type solution, we'll have some of these 
services will be northbound, uh, facing northbound APIs, talking to orchestration systems. Some will be protocols that are used to talk to devices, while others will be applications and services that, are, that form the business logic of, what your, of your solution. So this is, this, I don't expect you to read this slide necessarily. There's a link at the bottom if you want to, but the, the general point here is that there are a lot of different uh, services that have been developed on Open Daylight. And I think sometimes Open Daylight gets a kind of a bad rap for being really complicated, uh, but the, the fact of the matter, and, and I think a lot of that is because of all of these options and uh, trying to figure out, okay, what exactly do I need to do? What, what do I need to use here? But in the solution that we're talking about, which is Netvert, we really only use a small subset of those, um, highlighted in, in red here, that uh, implement this, this service. And, and potentially others in the future as we uh, look to uh, integrate with VPP, which um, we'll um, be talking about later on, in another talk. But, um, but these are, there are tools there that you can use. You don't have to use all of them. And it's, it's not very complicated to install it. It's, uh, you fire up your craft. Uh, instance and install um, ODL, v Netvert, OpenStack, and it pulls in everything that it needs, and that's it. Or better yet, it's, this is all integrated with the triple O uh, based installer and um, can be included in the installation of the overall cloud. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this the Op Open Daylight Netvert application um, and what's happening in inside of Open Daylight to make it work. Open Daylight has one common northbound uh, API, N Neutron northbound, to communicate with Open Daylight, and this is, or OpenStack. This is done so that uh, it can to, uh, foster innovation within Open Daylight and allow multiple different applications to be developed to support OpenStack. And several have been, several have been developed, and some have been you know, consolidated, and um, I think we've, we're kind of uh, arriving on uh, Netvert being one of the most popular and most active uh, one of those solutions. Netvert, uh, so Neutron's, Northbound's job is to receive the, the configuration information from, from, from Neutron, from networking ODL, store it in, this, in the MD cell. And it's not really shown here, but of course, this is all, all this stuff is built upon the MD cell, and most of the APIs between these uh, components are, uh, are based on MD cell. But, uh, <coughs> Uh, the, within Netvert, it listens to this, this data store through notifications, and, um, and when a, a, something, a configuration is, is passed down from, from Neutron, uh, op, uh, Netvert goes, goes to work in uh, configuring the, the devices to support what's needed. Within, within Netvert, it's built, we have our own uh, network, abstract network model. And we don't use exactly the Neutron, because model, because this is designed as a, Netvert is designed to support multiple different northbound plugins, and there's work also going on to integrate with uh, Kubernetes and uh, potentially in other northbound APIs as well. There's a MEF-based uh, API uh, that, that drives Netvert as well. So it's a generic network virtualization <laughs> solution. And each of the, within Netvert, the, uh, the different components are modular to support layer two, layer three, uh, v, v, VPN services. And then southbound, w there's a renderer model where we can use this, this, uh, this data model and render it onto different devices. So currently, it's mainly OpenFlow and OVSDB-based devices, so OVS switches and hardware VTEP. Uh, the renderer, so for hardware top rack switches that support OVSDB, uh, but work is going on. Uh, but we also uh, communicate with BGP routers for our BGP VPN support for multi-site. And then work is going on to support VPP and then also physical uh, underlay devices. So I have a list of features here. I'm not going to really go through all of them uh, in, in, in depth, but uh, the, the, suffice it to say that there's a, a pretty comprehensive support for Neutron APIs. And um, we're, you know, this new, new features are being uh, implemented in each release. Fully distributed, uh, layer three, layer two, layer three routing, um, uh, VXLAN overlay, various types of overlays, NAT support, security groups, so it's, it's very functional. And, some, and I also wanted to point out some of the key work that's going, going on moving forward 
and that's, uh, that I've, I've touched on some of these earlier, but the container integration, there's a project for that. Uh, physical network control, EVPN. So we have EP, EVPN for intercloud, but for controlling devices within the cloud. And then um, this, the VPP and uh, GPP in integration. And I just one last slide here that this is really done a, is a cross com community collaboration with a, a, a number of different open source communities. One of the ones we work with really heavily, well, of course, OpenStack that we're talking about today, but in addition to OpenStack, OPNFV is a, is a, is a place where a lot of these things are pulled together, integrated, tested, and verified. So, all right, I'll, at this point, I'll hand it back to, to Nir. Thank you. Um, so last section, I wanted to talk a little bit about Open Daylight and Red Hat. So what we are doing with Open Daylight in terms of kind of pro productization. Um, so our current Open Daylight focus, and I think Andre touched a little bit uh, of it before. Um, so this is, these are the projects we are involved with. Um, so on the left side, these are the Open Daylight projects we are actively contributing to and working on. So obviously, kind of the core open daylight beast, uh, bits, the MD cell and Yang tools and other kind of the basic infrastructure pieces of open daylight. And then everything which is uh, related to the Neutron use case, right? The OpenStack integration. So Neutron Northbound as a project and then NetVirt as our service provider. Um, and it's really, um, we are really happy to see kind of this upstream convergence around NetVirt. Uh, so we're working with, um, you know, uh, folks from uh, NEC and Ericsson and others, uh, and it, we're really happy to see everyone kind of agreeing on NetVirt being the main kind of provider for, for OpenStack networking. Um, SFC is another project uh, which we are integrating into NetVirt uh, to solve the service function chaining use case. Um, we are working, again, very closely with the other communities, with the kernel team, with the OVS, uh, because we need NSH support for that, um, and this is something we are um, eagerly waiting for. Um, and a bunch of integration and testing, so all the kind of packaging and testing to make sure that what we are doing is properly tested. And on the southbound side, as Andrew mentioned, we are currently mostly focused on two protocols and projects, OVSDB and OpenFlow, to interact with OVS, OVS DPDK, or top of rec switches, which are really based on the OVSDB hardware VTAP scheme, um, which we think are kind of the very fundamental uh, pieces we need to provide an, an, a good, over, a decent overlay solution. But definitely the native evolution of that is to go NetConf um, and BGP and others to provide more comprehensive insight into the physical underlay, the physical fabric. Um, and then on the OpenStack side, it's on the right side here, uh, we are obviously uh, contributing to Neutron because, again, we don't want to um, replace Neutron here, right? Neutron is still where the networking API is being defined. We just want to implement this API using Open Daylight. Uh, so we want to make sure that Neutron is healthy as a community, but also that uh, the right features and abstraction, uh, abstraction, sorry, are getting into the upstream bits. Obviously, networking ODL, which is the project uh, with the collection of plugins and drivers for Open Daylight to Neutron, and then Triple O, which is our uh, deployment-based uh, system for, uh, uh, sorry, project for OpenStack. Um, and Andre touched uh, before about the kind of the complexity of Open Daylight and you know this huge you know, number of projects there, and we are really proud to like we, we work we did with Triple O to kind of make it very easy to consume. So we we do have. Um, basically images and e-templates and everything you need to orchestrate uh, an installation of OpenStack together with Open Daylight, which is really uh, simple. So this is something we are uh, working on as well. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, commercial product, so starting with Red Hat OpenStack Platform 8, which is our Liberty-based OpenStack platform, uh, we are bundling a, a an Open Daylight RPM, an Open Daylight package, together with our OpenStack platform product. Um, and it's currently offered as a technology preview. So it's not fully supported, but the bits are accessible to all of our customers. Um, and again, we are not um, packaging everything in Open Daylight. We are really, really focusing on the OpenStack uh, networking use case. So we are essentially packaging the NetVirt project and all the required dependencies to run it. So the base controller stuff, the protocols, the southbound protocols we need, and so on. 
Um, and the idea is really to provide it as a backend to Neutron. So instead of using um, the ML2 OVS uh, kind of driver or maybe Linux Bridge and, and so on, basically using Open Daylight as a backend. Um, I really encourage you to find out more here. Uh, we have two links. Uh, the first one, it's actually a blog post um, explaining what we are doing, and there's a link to documentation and, and inside. And the second one is just an email alias. So if you want to give us any feedback about the platform, your use cases and experience, so we're glad to hear and, and talk to you. Uh, and this is just to show the Red Hat package. So again, very um, kind of focused on our use case. Basically, um, the APIs we need, Netvirt as, as, a, as a base application, and OpenFlow and OVSDB. Uh, but again, we do have plans to go into other uh, applications and, and plugins uh, based on, on the use cases we see. And definitely the, the main demand is from the NFV market, which is driving a lot of our open daylight work. Uh, but again, we do see also customers on the enterprise side kind of benefiting from, from this work. Um, and my last slide is for, again, some links for further reading. And the slides will be available after this uh, talk, so you can just click the links. So some more information about the upstream project we talked about, uh, in particular the NetVid project, uh, Genius, and the container orchestration engine project, uh, which we are all kind of um, active in, in the upstream currently. Um, and then on the product side, we have our product documentation. Uh, we have a product guide and an installation and configuration guide, which is basically explaining how to use O to deploy Red Hat OpenStack together with Open Daylight. Uh, so this is really cool. I encourage you to check it. Uh, and then some more uh, kind of NFV-related documentation. Um, that's it. Uh, we have around five minutes for questions. So um, there are two mics, one on the left and one on the right. So. Could you put up the first slide with the location of the spines down Sure. Do you mind using the mic? Because this is being recorded, sorry. Well, I don't think they. <clears throat> so uh, in your last slide, you showed the, um, the ODL um, API. And then in your slide, you showed a whole stack of um, you know, diagrams and you know, components that were used for OpenStack in this particular case. How much in, in that slide in particular that was really very busy, and you just selected the ones that were necessary or required. How much more development work is needed to support in those particular projects to support, for example, the uh, OpenStack uh, um, SDN controller use case? It, it's all there. It's working now. Well, but um, what if like additional components that were not selected there was needed to be done? Um, because you know you're talking about the complexity that people thought was surrounding this, and I would imagine that was because maybe some people at some point were using this, realized maybe there was something additional to be integrated into this. So I think, so right now we have a NetVert, it's really a comprehensive Neutron backend. It provides net, the NetVert, using NetVert with Open Daylight provides you with a comprehensive Neutron backend, um, you know, for OpenStack, and it, it, if you want to control OVS or uh, top or X switches. Now, if you want to say, we, we mentioned using, uh, controlling VPP switches, the FIDO VPP, so that's additional work. So that's new, ca new capabilities. We're also planning to do work on new controlling, controlling the, the, the underlay physical devices. So that would be new work, but uh, if, you, if you basically want to use OVS and, uh, and, and the L2 gateway, uh, it works today. In a kind of vanilla OpenStack configuration with Neutron, uh, with DVR enabled, you lose really the ability to do DPDK acceleration in the compute nodes. Does bringing in Open Daylight and NetVert give you the ability to solve that problem so you can do a DVR architecture with DPDK in the it, compute It nodes? does, yeah. You don't actually use DVR. Uh, Open Daylight well, is, is <coughs> de facto a DVR. Yeah, I mean, we don't and, and use... And it supports, it, it supports uh, DPDK. Yeah, I mean, Open Daylight does, doesn't rely on kernel constructs like namespaces to provide routing. So it's basically just OpenFlow with OVS. So from Open Daylight perspective, 
we are talking OVSDB and OpenFlow to OVS, and then it could be data, DPDK data path or kernel data path. Both are going to work the same way. Yeah. Uh, a BGP question. Um, so if you have, a, say, an, an open contrail deployment, um, should we expect that open, an open daylight deployment would be able to BGP peer with open contrail and be able to exchange routes and integrate with that? Or? In fact, it can. I actually learned that today that uh, some, some folks from Ericsson did a demo during uh, like a recent, I can't remember when it was, but where they, they showed uh, open daylight peering with open contrail and also with uh, Nuwash, so the three different. So that's one of the advantages of using this, using routing for peering. Yeah. All right, thanks. Slides that you mentioned that there's multi-site support uh, using BGP peering. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that, don't take, take it. That's the EVPN. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, so um, we the network supports uh, BGP BGP VPN um, support services. So there's a, a BGP VPN plugin or a, a Neutron service that so it can be controlled via OpenStack, and then um, the Open Daylight will use BGP to exchange routes between the different sites and allow connectivity between the two. And what's supported uh, currently, and, and so we use externally from Open Daylight, we use an instance of Quagga to do the peering, so that's where the BGP is implemented. But then that peers with a, a physical uh, gateway. And um, then uh, it can be used to, again, exchange routes between the two different sites and then use uh, an uh, MPLS uh, over GRE um, encapsulation with BGP VPN to, uh, for communications between the sites through these gateways. And then um, also added uh, this during this latest release uh, was uh, support for EVPN encapsulation for layer two. So the first one is layer three, the second one is, is supports layer two as well. Hi, yeah, I had looked at Open Daylight a, a while ago now and one of the things it was lacking was the controller clustering. What's the current state of that? So uh, controller clustering is supported, it's, uh, and it works reasonably well. It's something, it is one area that we're gonna keep banging on to, to make sure that it, it, it works uh, flawlessly, but uh, it is something that we're planning to have and uh, in, in, is supported by a number of uh, vendors. Okay, it's, it's no longer just, what, uh, Cassandra? Because I think that's what it was at some point. Right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, built into the MD-SAL um, that okay. has implemented uh, a, a raft protocol to okay. ensure consistency between the, the databases. Yeah. So it's all built yeah. into MD-SAL. Okay. Yeah, and just to say that uh, currently with uh, the triple O work we are doing, so like if you take the uh, kind of uh, Okata bits, uh, we are still deploying just one instance of Open Daylight. But starting with the next version, um, we are going to basically deploy n numbers of, uh, of controllers. So it's going to be baked into triple O as well. Okay, great. We're working on it. Thanks. Would, uh, would triple O um, deploy a set of controllers? And if you have a multi site you know, open stack deployment, would triple O deploy controllers in every site and then you federate them? or? So do you have a centralized uh, architecture? What so currently, we, we, we have support just for one OpenStack cloud. Um, that's our first phase. Uh, but once we get there, we definitely want to look at into the multi-site kind of use case and, and solve it. So currently, we do not support kind of multi-site with Open Daylight. And what is the kind of the roadmap, the timeline for that? I cannot say. I mean, it's, uh, it's something which is bigger than Open Daylight because there are also limitations on triple O itself to support multi-site. Um, so we are working on it, but I don't have a concrete kind of version right now. Okay. Yeah. One last question. <laughs> there was a nice graphical user interface to Open Daylight, which I utilized. I don't know a year before this day, and um, you could very easily show the flows between the right. nodes, things like that, which was really beautiful because normally you don't see that, and you have just rough understanding. So, um, will we include? As, as as I thought, it's not really included at the moment, right? 
So actually it is. Um, yeah. it is. It's called Deluxe, uh, Daylight User Experience, ah, and it's okay. part of uh, our package. Okay. Um, well, we did some change recently. We changed uh, some stuff on Netvirt uh, that broke some of that, but we are, we, we are working to fix it. And yeah, I mean, there is a great benefit on having, on having something like Deluxe because it's kind of, uh, from an operational point of view, it's giving you a better kind of visibility into the flows. Because troubleshooting open flow rules on OVS, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, hard, it's yes. a hard job. So it's kind of visualizing the tables and, and flows and like VXN IDs per turn and so on. So it's definitely included. Um, and it's tech preview, so you can definitely play with it and give us feedback. I mean, we know there are some bugs, uh, but we are definitely working on it. And I, are you asking about the basic deluxe interface, or the, uh, there was also some more kind of a POC to, to expose additional information about Netvert and the switches, the physical switches and the flows? That would so, be great. <laughs> yeah, so there, that existed as well. I, don't, I think it, uh, it's, it was more of a POC and, and it hasn't been maintained as well as it, it should have been, but it's something we definitely have on our kind of road, you know, at least list of things to do, let's call it that. Yeah. So do you think Open Daylight will be the default in our deployment in two years, I don't know, from now? Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I think that uh, we, we should at least recommend it for, at least for NFV and yeah. for our NFVI stack. Because again, currently, we are defaulting to just OVS TPDK uh, or SROIOV with the OVS agent. Uh, which is usually a no-go for, 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 for NFV, right? And then people do want kind of a robust SDM platform, and we think that Open Data is the natural evolution of that. So Open Data would be the recommended for NFV, and then again, if you are a big enough enterprise and, and you have the right use case, you can use it as well, but at least for NFV, we think it should be the default. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.